like that. Yes. 
Uh, no. 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 Uh, Cantonese. Oh, Cantonese. I see. Yeah. Um, I saw uh, some of read some of your reports from a Japanese. Ah. Okay. Um, uh, you familiar with the situation across the street, right? Yes. Yeah. About yeah. 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 Yes. Thank you for coming. Sure. We're juggling the order a little bit on this panel. We're going to do Mike, Drew, and Christine. Okay. Here. So, is, so you're based in uh, Philadelphia? I'm actually based in Washington, but the uh, think tank is in Philadelphia. You're based here? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So is, you you have a local number here? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll we'll we'll just give you my phone. I know, because sometimes... Uh, One of my former colleagues works at Voice of America, actually. Who? Uh, well, her husband. Um, not, in, um, not, not in the Mandarin? I'm from the Mandarin service. Uh, I'm not sure where he works. He might be. He might be. He is uh, Chinese. Oh, really? Or was Chinese. He's American now. Uh huh. I know, but 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 he's probably you. You don't know his name. Uh, not off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, so if, if you know of anybody in your office that whose wife works at the State Department. Lipo. Lipo. Yeah, yeah, Lipo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 His wife is here. Oh, is she? Yeah. I, see I saw her home. outside. I don't know if she's in, um, participating in this program or the other one because there's another one going on in the other room. <laughs> the heck is my cell number? <laughs> <laughs> so you work? Um, I know, but you work here? Or in the Washington area, yeah. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, okay. Do you have a Chinese name? <laughs> Am I asking too much? <laughs> Uh, Mike is one, two, and three. Your Chinese Chinese name? Uh, you you don't I'd rather rather not. Okay, so, so this is the name you go yeah. by. You don't okay because usually you know if we see uh, a, a Chinese um, name, it, it doesn't translate exactly. I know, but sometimes they will have a you know, they, they will have a Chinese name, and oh, then yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so we can uh, because we we write in Chinese, so we will usually uh, put the Chinese name English name oh, both. Okay. Yeah, so so. What I want to say, you, are you only moderating or you're going to talk? I'm only moderating. In fact, I don't even know why I'm moderating this session because, because I should really be moderating the next one. Oh, really? This is what I actually do, security architecture. Oh. <laughs> oh, am I? Yeah, you're being recorded, yeah. Great. <laughs> You should, they, they will have, a, should have an on off switch. Interesting. Is this usually push to talk that way? It's not. There is no off button. That's what I thought. There would be. Oh, you have all, you, do you need new business cards? I like the old ones. You do? Well, it's not our logo anymore. I know. Well, it's, ra it's raised. So you. So you're from sure. Philadelphia? Yes. From the, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm with the uh, Voice of America. I, was oh, I, I would give you my card, but I you just don't. ran out. How can you not have enough card? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't if know. you're organizing such conference with lots of people. I, I, well, if I was coming from my office, I would have a, a plethora, but at home I only have a little bit, so oh, I really? ran out of home. What's your name? Eli, e Eli Gilman. Okay. I'm the press contact at the office, so if you have any oh, questions, you can. Oh, then put my name. Yeah. Here, let me um let hey, let, me, let me do this for you. Well, you, you can write. Here. But uh, well, I don't I don't want to bother you know, mess up Felix's nice card. <laughs> The best way to sometimes reach me is uh, email. Okay. It's always the best yeah. way to reach me. Okay. So your your um, expertise or specialty is in the security situation. Security, in economics, energy. Oh, energy. Okay. Okay. But then, um, so 
about the what the, uh, Ambassador Wu was just saying about the security architecture that um, the President Xi was uh, uh, proposing. I didn't hear the whole thing. I just I came in actually uh, just half an hour ago. Yeah. So you think would that be uh, you know something if he said East Asian for Asian? I think that uh, a lot of mindsets would have to change for that to, to actually happen. Um, but uh, that's a much longer discussion. I can I could talk to you some other time on, on the email. I think yeah. Okay. Right now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Mainly I want to, want to get to. Okay. <laughs> Uh, sure, sure, sure. Oh, email.
Hey. So nice to see you again. Good to see you again. How are you? Good. I never see you. It's been like, you know, since Literally, the last, I, yeah, last time, yeah. <laughs> well, we had an email problem until last and December. And you were sick, too. There was yes, like a there was a period when I was sick. That's so, true. but you're, you're good. Your email's working, <laughs> and you're physically good. No, no, that's why I mean that. Yeah. So it's Mike, so Mike, Drew, me, Christine. Mike, Drew. Christine is last. Mike, Drew, me, and Christine. Oh, yeah, that makes, makes a bit more sense. So, um, which, by the way, I haven't seen or met Christine yet. Uh, How do you pronounce that? Well, I'm just going to say Korea. Yeah. It's Goguryo. Yeah. Good yeah. luck with that. So I'll let that leave that to her. Yeah. So we're actually talking about the 7th century. I'm actually talking about what? The 7th century. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm going to go back even farther than that. I'm going to go back to 1984. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Felix Chang. Oh, yes. Yeah. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you. I've quoted many of your works over the years. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we spoke on that. Yeah. Well, it's uh, All right. nice to meet you. Go ahead. Uh, well air conditioned up here. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yes. Hi, <laughs> So you're talking about Kokuryo, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. What is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that is that issue? Is that issue bubbling? Yeah. Or you're just asking for concerns. Yeah. Should probably not get too far behind schedule. Good morning, everyone. Whoa. Cut into my question. Uh, welcome to the first uh, full panel of today's conference. Uh, my name is Felix Chang. I'm a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, we'll be continuing our discussion on transnational challenges in East Asia with our first panel, which will now dig deeper into some of those challenges from a slightly different perspective, going below the envelope of, uh, of nation states uh, to investigate various issues related to uh, sovereignty, identity, um, and um, culture. We will start with a discussion of Okinawa, uh, moving on to uh, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and finally Korea. Um, so let me uh, introduce our first uh, panelist, uh, Mike Mochizuki. Uh, he's an associate professor of political science and international affairs at the Elliott School here at George Washington University. 
Um, he has served as uh, director of the Segura Center of Asian Studies, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and co-director of the Center for Asia Pacific Policy at RAND. Uh, he is currently completing a book entitled A New Strategic Triangle, The U.S.-Japan Alliance and the Rise of China. Without any further ado, Mike. Uh, thank you very much, Felix, and uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers uh, of this conference for inviting me to participate and also having the foresight uh, to include the topic of uh, Okinawa. Uh, this is a, a very opportune time to be speaking about Okinawa uh, because, as uh, some of you may know, uh, the newly elected governor of Okinawa, Takeshi Onaga, uh, is in Washington, D.C. He arrived uh, over the weekend and will be uh, uh, here through Thursday, uh, 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 through Wednesday, up until uh, Thursday, uh, to meet with uh, U.S. Uh, policy officials, uh, members of Congress, as well as uh, those in the academic and think tank uh, communities uh, to uh, talk about uh, uh, the Okinawa uh, issue and the U.S. military bases on Okinawa. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, in the limited amount of time that I have is to uh, discuss uh, uh, three things. Uh, first, uh, since uh, some of you may not be that aware about uh, Okinawa and its historical uh, background, I want to uh, say a few things or briefly summarize the very rich and complicated uh, history of Okinawa. Uh, secondly, uh, what I'd like to do is to apply uh, the economist Albert uh, Hirschman's uh, distinction uh, uh, between uh, exit, uh, loyalty, and voice uh, to the Okinawa question, and then finally end up by focusing uh, a little bit more deeply on the issue of uh, voice. Uh, uh, first, in terms of the general background of Okinawa, uh, Okinawa in terms of land area uh, is uh, certainly one of the smallest prefectures in uh, Japan. Uh, it ranks uh, 44th out of the 47 uh, prefectures. The only smaller uh, prefectures in terms of land size are uh, Tokyo, To, uh, Osaka, Fu, uh, and uh, Kana uh, Kagawa uh, Prefecture. Uh, but in terms of population, it ranks 29th out of 47 prefectures with 1.4 uh, million uh, people. Uh, but although Okinawa is small in size, uh, the geography uh, of Okinawa is quite expansive. Uh, you know, if you were to measure from the northern tip of the main island of Okinawa all the way down to uh, Yonaguni, uh, which is very close uh, to Taiwan, uh, then it covers about 400 miles, which is almost the distance uh, between Boston and Washington, D.C., or between Tokyo and Okayama uh, Prefecture. Uh, uh, for better or for worse, uh, Okinawa, or traditionally the Ryukyu Islands, uh, has been located in a very strategically important uh, area, and this has given it uh, both advantages and disadvantages. Uh, in terms of advantages, uh, because it was located on many of the major sea routes, uh, it could prosper uh, through trade. Uh, but because uh, of its uh, geostrategic uh, location, it was also buffeted uh, by changes, uh, geopolitical changes in the region, and even internal changes in the neighboring great powers, uh, whether it was China, Korea, uh, Japan, or even uh, the kingdoms of Southeast Asia. In terms of history, uh, you can probably uh, divide up uh, Okinawa history into five uh, major uh, periods. Uh, the first uh, period uh, would uh, go from about 1429 uh, to 1609. Uh, this is after the unification uh, of the various domains on Ryukyu uh, into a united Ryukyu kingdom, and it was during this period uh, that the Ryukyu kingdom uh, uh, paid tribute uh, to uh, Ming uh, uh, China. Uh, and then uh, we enter the second phase, uh, which I would say spans from 1609 uh, into the 1870s. And this is a very interesting period in which uh, the Ryukyu Kingdom uh, uh, experienced a period of what uh, some have called uh, dual subordination uh, between uh, the Satsuma domain of Japan on the one hand and on China uh, on the other. 
And what ushers in this period uh, is in uh, the Satsuma invasion of the Ryukyu Kingdom in 1609, uh, when uh, the Satsuma uh, warriors uh, seize and imprison uh, the Ryukyu uh, monarch. And in the wake of this, uh, Satsuma controlled the terms of trade uh, of the Ryukyu uh, Kingdom. And so after 1609, uh, the Ryukyu Kingdom uh, played a very delicate balancing act of being a vassal political entity of the Satsuma domain on the one hand and uh, continuing to be a tributary state of China, uh, f first under the Ming uh, and then under the Qing. And it's during this period uh, that uh, Commodore P Perry uh, first arrived uh, to uh, today's Okinawa in 1853 uh, en route uh, to his ultimate destination of uh, uh, Shimoda to open up uh, uh, Japan. And it was a, a very kind of impetuous uh, Commodore Perry who insisted uh, that he uh, enter into the royal palace of the Ryukyu Kingdom, and if the Ryukyu Kingdom did not allow it, then he would uh, enter uh, that palace with force uh, using uh, the force of military uh, arms. Uh, the third uh, period uh, spans from uh, uh, the 1870s, uh, uh, probably most precisely 1879, uh, when Japan annexed uh, Ryukyu uh, into uh, uh, the post-war period 1945. Uh, uh, in uh, 1872, uh, Japan moves, this is after the Meiji Restoration, and abolishes uh, the Ryukyu Kingdom and turns it into a domain. And then after this, uh, there is an incident uh, involving a Ryukyu shipwreck uh, off of the Taiwan coast, uh, and the local people on Taiwan ends up killing uh, the, uh, uh, the, Ryukyu, uh, the crew of the Ryukyu uh, ship. And this gives Japan uh, the rationale uh, to send a military expedition uh, to Taiwan in 1874, uh, this is known as the Formosa uh, incident, and in a sense, this is really the beginning of the military uh, pressure uh, that Japan uh, places on uh, Taiwan. Uh, and then uh, in 1879, Japan formally annexes the Ryukyu domain and converts it into the Okinawa prefecture, uh, and the Meiji leadership uh, deposes the Ryukyu monarch, uh, gives him the title of, of marquis, and, and is part, uh, it becomes part of the Japanese uh, peerage. Uh, the uh, Qing, uh, China uh, tries to contest the sovereignty of the Ryukyu kingdom uh, and, and even tries to uh, engage the United States, especially former President uh, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, but this diplomatic uh, effort fails and uh, Japan proceeds uh, to engage in a vigorous policy of assimilation and the incorporation of the, UK, uh, the remnants of the Ryukyu Kingdom as Okinawa uh, Prefecture. Now during World War II, it's interesting uh, that the Republic of China uh, wanted to uh, restore, uh, in their view, uh, uh, the, what they call the Ryukyu as part of, of China. And in fact, uh, in November 1943, uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, meets with President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in Cairo, uh, in which uh, the Cairo Declaration uh, uh, emerged. And in a meeting, uh, President Roosevelt raises the issue about uh, the control of the Ryukyu Islands. And in fact, uh, he proposes to Chiang Kai-shek uh, that possibly the Ryukyu Islands could go uh, to uh, China, and here uh, Chiang Kai-shek states uh, that uh, China would be agreeable to a joint occupation with the United States of the Ryukyu uh, territories, and later joint administration under UN uh, trusteeship. Also another very important uh, part of this period from 1870 to 1945 is, of course, uh, the Battle of Okinawa and the sacrifice of the Okinawans. Uh, uh, this battle, uh, you know, took place 70 years uh, ago, uh, from eight, uh, April to June 1945. Uh, the number of casualties, the deaths from the Battle of Okinawa, uh, was uh, uh, over 240,000 uh, people. 
uh, and nearly 150,000 Okinawan civilians were killed, uh, over 77,000 Japanese soldiers, uh, and over uh, 14,000 U.S. Uh, soldiers. Uh, now, uh, this is a contested uh, issue of history between Okinawans and, and Japan, uh, but there is quite a bit of evidence uh, that the Japanese engaged in military atrocities against the Okinawans uh, using civilians as human shields, uh, forcefully confiscating the food of civilians, uh, and, and uh, inducing the collective suicide uh, of uh, uh, Okinawan uh, civilians. And then we enter the fourth period uh, from 1945 to 1972, uh, when the United States occupied uh, uh, Korea, uh, uh, occupied uh, Okinawa, and only uh, accepted uh, Japan's residual sovereignty uh, over Okinawa. Uh, now, the United States was very much concerned uh, about uh, the rise of anti-base uh, movements uh, on the main islands of Okinawa, uh, and uh, that would then possibly morph into a, a very robust uh, anti U.S.-Japan Security Treaty uh, movement, and therefore uh, Okinawa became the depository of many of the U.S. Uh, military uh, uh, bases uh, while U.S. troops uh, were reduced on the main islands. And then the argument uh, that American policymakers also made was it would be cheaper uh, to have the, the, uh, the bases in, in Okinawa. And when I looked at the documents, the amount of strategic rationale for moving the bases uh, to Okinawa was not uh, the paramount uh, consideration. Uh, the other interesting thing about this period uh, is that U.S. military authorities were very much interested in reviving a separate UQ identity, uh, separate from Japan, in order to promote uh, UQ language, history, and an effort uh, to split uh, Okinawa from uh, Japan. And so then, uh, you know, when there was a move to uh, revert Japan, uh, Okinawa back to uh, Japan, uh, there was quite a bit of resistance uh, from uh, the U.S. Uh, um, military. Uh, finally, in 1972, uh, Okinawa uh, does revert to Japan, and, and that is uh, the current uh, period that we uh, live in. Now, to get to the second uh, part of my uh, remarks on exit loyalty and voice uh, and how it relates to the evolution of Okinawan uh, identity. And when I look at Okinawan history, one of the striking things uh, about Okinawa is the amount of loyalty that uh, Okinawans or those who live on the Dikyu Islands uh, gave uh, to uh, their more superior uh, powers uh, that were the patrons uh, of uh, Okinawa. So, uh, you know, during the period that uh, uh, the Ryukyu Kingdom uh, was a tributary uh, entity uh, uh, of China, uh, it was quite earnest in keeping the Chinese happy uh, by paying uh, tribute. And then, uh, as I mentioned, when there was this period of dual subordination between Satsuma on the one hand and China on the other, uh, uh, the, uh, the Okinawans uh, skillfully managed uh, this subordination uh, and expressed loyalty uh, to both. Now also, uh, after the annexation of Okinawa by uh, Japan, uh, uh, the Okinawans then uh, uh, expressed their loyalty uh, to Imperial Japan, uh, and part of this was the byproduct of a vigorous program of assimilation through education and the promotion of loyalty to the emperor uh, and to, incur, uh, to discourage uh, local customs, folkways, and language. Uh, but this assimilation policy only went so far. Okinawans uh, continued to have uh, a uh, sense that they were being discriminated against, uh, and in many respects, uh, Okinawans were treated as second-class citizens, uh, and therefore, uh, in self-defense, uh, the Okinawans uh, who went overseas uh, organized uh, themselves. Also, the Japanese military seemed to be quite dissatisfied uh, uh, with the Okinawans because they were not uh, vigorous supporters of military expansion by the the Japanese, uh, and uh, uh, they did not glorify uh, 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 war and were not 
uh, supportive of the extreme uh, nationalism. Uh, and in fact, uh, the uh, Japanese commander of the Okinawan uh, garrison forces uh, uh, criticized uh, the easygoing uh, nature of the Okinawan uh, uh, use. But what's surprising, though, is despite this discrimination and despite the sacrifice, uh, the Okinawans uh, uh, had a desire to return to Japan and they embraced uh, reversion, uh, but ultimately uh, that re in post-reversion there was a great deal of disappointment uh, because uh, they thought that through uh, reversion that the U.S. military presence uh, would be uh, reduced. Now in terms of exit, in terms of exit, uh, um, uh, after uh, World War II uh, there was a movement uh, for independence but in the end, the majority of Okinawans uh, wanted to return uh, to uh, Japan. Now today, again, uh, there is some discourse among the, in the academic community in Okinawa uh, for uh, reversion, but at this uh, time, I would say that uh, most Okinawans uh, still think that it is better to be part of Okinawa, uh, 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 to be part of uh, Japan and, and remain as Okinawa. Uh, uh, prefecture. And so rather than uh, moving towards voice, uh, moving towards exit, I think the preferred uh, modality is for uh, the Okinawans to express uh, voice. Uh, and here, uh, you know, just very quickly, in terms of diplomacy, uh, although Okinawans, like the, the uh, residents of the main islands of Japan, have an increasingly negative view of China, uh, they do not want to see a militarization of the tensions between Japan and, and China because if there were a military conflict, it would be uh, uh, Okinawa that would be a frontline state in that, uh, in that uh, conflict. Also in terms of voice, uh, Okinawa has a history problem uh, with the rest of Japan uh, as well. And because of that, it's quite possible that Okinawa could uh, lead the way in terms of promoting uh, reconciliation between Japan on the one hand uh, and its Asian neighbors uh, like China uh, and uh, Korea. Now finally, uh, there is the issue of voice regarding the U.S. military uh, bases. And since I've already run out of time, I don't want to go into uh, in, in detail uh, about this. But one of the things that I would like to emphasize is that many U.S. policymakers tend to see uh, the Okinawa issue as a minor issue or a not-in-your-backyard uh, issue. And I think that's a fundamental uh, mistaken view of this, issue, of this issue. The Okinawan issue is, you know, I would regard it as a nodal security issue uh, in the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance. And there is this conventional wisdom uh, that the new uh, base uh, that is being now constructed uh, off of uh, Henoko uh, as a replacement for the Fudema Air Station <laughs> is absolutely necessary from the point of view of deterrence uh, and is, uh, is the best uh, alternative uh, uh, that, that is available. And I think uh, one of the problems is that both the U.S. and, and the Japanese security community has not looked at this issue uh, critically. And my fear is that if the U.S. and Japanese governments uh, continue to stubbornly push the construction of the Henoko base despite uh, the widespread and deep opposition in Okinawa, uh, then this could undermine the U.S. ability uh, to have stable use of the more important military installations uh, on uh, Okinawa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will be taking uh, questions at the end of uh, this panel's uh, talks. So right now we'll be moving on to another region that is uh, uh, fraught with a different uh, type of conflict. Uh, Dr. Gladney, Drew Gladney, will be discussing Xinjiang. Dr. Gladney is a professor of anthropology at Pomona College. Uh, he has also been president of the Pacific Basin Institute, professor of Asian studies at the University of Hawaii, and a senior research fellow at the East-West Center. Uh, his research focuses on ethnic and cultural nationalism in Asia, and his most recent book is Dislocating China, Muslims, Minority, 
and other subaltern subjects. Dr. Gladney. Thank you, uh, Felix and Jacques and the FPRI with the Wilson Center uh, and the Kissinger Institute for uh, organizing this conference. Um, also inviting an anthropologist to take part in these kinds of policy discussions. Uh, and also historians who can give us light and enlightening insights into um, some important regions that often do not get considered when we talk about great power relations. Um, as an anthropologist, I find that uh, this region that I work in is often neglected. Uh, recently, Xinjiang has been much in the news, so people are a little more familiar with it. But I just want to touch on a few of the uh, larger issues that bind China to its larger uh, participation in global uh, challenges, particularly the rise of ISIS, their appeal to Muslims in China and in Central Asia, possible participation of Uyghurs in the ISIS conflict in Syria uh, and Iraq, uh, and also the issue of nationalism in China, which I think looms over a lot of uh, this discussion, something I've been looking at for, for a very long time, uh, and try to make some recommendations. Now, as an anthropologist, I need to make a nod uh, and recognition uh, to Clifford Geertz, because as I looked at the title of our, of our conference, Blurring Boundaries, uh, I thought very uh, quickly of Clifford Geertz's uh, terminology, uh, blur genres. Uh, I had the privilege of spending a year with him in Princeton, your northern neighbor at the Institute for Advanced Study, where also Albert Hirschman was there. And I enjoyed his uh, insights into the economic challenges posed by exit voice and loyalty in a place like Western China and Xinjiang. Uh, I don't think there's been much voice, no possibility of exit, and um, not much loyalty out there either. So uh, I don't know, Albert and I used to talk about that quite a bit. What do you have? We have no, no, no alternatives. Uh, you have problems. So um, uh, Geertz's interest was trying to look at how social science and the humanities have been able to sort of stumble over each other. And of course, as an anthropologist, he was interested in introducing cases and interpretations uh, to sort of mitigate some of the hard sciences and the statistics that might suggest a more clear-cut answer to, uh, to certain recent problems. Clearly, I think today we've all come to realize that Geertz was right. Uh, we need to talk with each other. We need to cross disciplines and cross boundaries to be able to get to the bottom of some of these issues and make some recommendations. Um, the other anthropologist uh, that I take inspiration from in looking at this issue of blurring boundaries is Tongchai Vinichako. Uh, uh, trained in Madison, uh, or teaching now at Madison, recent uh, president of the Association for Asian Studies, whose work on the geo body of the Thai nation was the first to really uh, dismiss the idea that national boundaries were natural uh, and that it was only under the empires that loyalty was critical, uh, whereas nation state boundaries and the delineations that took place as a result of the Westphalian Conference uh, were really a modern phenomenon. Uh, and that in the past, people didn't really think too much about boundaries uh, and borders. They talked about loyalties. Uh, in the modern nation state, however, uh, we tend to focus on fixed boundaries and maintaining those lines. Uh, China has been very successful, particularly in the post-Soviet transition and firming up those boundaries. But I think even when we look at the world through Google's eye, uh, we tend to think that the world has fixed boundaries. Uh, and the reality, of course, is it, doesn't, it is not that way. And what we've been seeing in the Middle East is a lot of blurring of boundaries. And the question posed by ISIS is, can a new kind of nation uh, maintain a state based on a religious ideology? And of course, they want a global state under one Ummah, under one religion, uh, not just the Middle East. Um, but of course, it is ra uh, raising a lot of fears in the region about the uh, flexibility of these boundaries that they've so easily crossed and blended. Uh, so that today, when we look at a place like China, we tend to think of it as a rather uh, uh, well-situated, uh, bounded nation state. But we forget that, as Benedict Anderson once said, it was very much like stretching uh, the, the body of the nation state over the old empire. And I think it was Lucian Pai who said that China really is an empire that's seeking to be a nation state. And what we see of modern day China is the expansion 
of the old Chinese, particularly northern Chinese rule uh, of the Han peoples over into regions that they only recently have occupied. And we see this very clearly in its nationalities policy, which is a legacy of the Soviet period and the Republican period. Particularly, I'll just mention this term, Minzu, which is going to come up later when I discuss uh, some of the debates about nationalism in China today, which is a Chinese uh, sort of invented term inherited by, from Japan uh, as a translation of the German Volk uh, that only arises in China within the last 70 or 80 years. Uh, and it uses this post-Soviet policy to identify 55 minority groups, the largest of which uh, are a group people hardly ever talk about, the Zhuang, second of the Manchu, but the third are a Muslim group, the Hui, which I won't be talking about very much today, but I will touch more about the Uyghurs, 10 uh, Muslim nationalities, uh, and so they're recognized in China, uh, nearly uh, almost 300 million people today. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that they use a Stalinist policy to delineate these groups, um, and many groups did not get recognized. In fact, today there are over a million unrecognized people. And I hope uh, Jacques uh, gets, I just came from Hong Kong. Uh, once Hong Kong has been reintegrated into China, it becomes even more problematic on what are the nationalities of all these uh, different citizens, the new citizens of China. Uh, and this is a problem for the old Soviet policy, which does not stretch so easily over the nation, and one of the problems that the Soviet Union had. Now, the problem with the fixed maps of China and other countries is that we fail to realize that over the millennia, uh, we have had moving maps, moving boundaries. And if we look at the long durée of Chinese history, we realize that these Western regions have rarely been part of what we know as China or what the Chinese knew as China. Uh, so the idea that China has always had this fixed boundary, which is really uh, a legacy of the Manchu and Mongolian uh, reigns, which were, of course, conquest empires, uh, is, very, is also rather recent. Uh, and the Western regions have only been recently uh, attempted to be re reintegrated into Chinese rule. I don't have time to go through this moving map. Uh, you can go to the Pacific Basin Institute website. At Pomona College, we developed this to try to give people an idea that time and space do matter. Uh, and if we look at the history, we begin to realize that these regions of China have only been recently integrated. Now, of course, we know that in China's developmental policy, these areas have only recently been integrated. Uh, in the earlier phases, there was very little interest in the Western regions. It's really been only under the late Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao that this region has begun to be very important and critical for China's future development. Uh, and it's clear that under Xi Jinping, that this final effort to push Chinese rule even beyond the borders of China, I will argue for economic influence and perhaps political influence, less territorial, but certainly trade uh, is going to be, this region will be even more increasingly critical to China's future development. Now, it's very rare that I get to uh, quote the Turkish press uh, when I speak to an East Asia audience. Uh, but I think it's important that the Turks are very interested in getting engaged and being on the eastern or western terminus of this iron silk robe. Uh, and the relations of China have warmed considerably uh, since um, uh, Erdogan, Premier Erdogan, made his uh, historic visit to Xinjiang. Um, and if you think pronouncing Erdogan's name is difficult, try uh, the authors of this op-ed, Seljuk Cholak Olu and Emre Tunç Soka Olu. And the Olu just means son of. Uh, so it's one of the uh, legacies of the early Turkish uh, agglutinative language. Uh, now, uh, these authors have been writing quite a bit on the Iron Silk Road uh, and the role of warmed Turkish-Chinese relations. But there's always a thorn in this problem, in this development, and that's the question of the Uyghur, who are also strongly present in Turkish society and quite popular uh, engaged. Um, also, Quartz had a recent article about this that I thought was pretty important, and that it points out that, um, if we can get rid of that, box, there we go, um, points out that, of course, as the Chinese are investing $140 billion in rail infrastructural networks, President Obama has only proposed uh, $50 billion, 
uh, and that uh, 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 Chinese blood is pumping through the Eurasian veins as the more populous important hemisphere unites into an organic whole. Now, it's rather alarmist uh, to some analysts, uh, whereas in some regions, uh, they see this as potential for hope. Uh, it was in Syria, remember, uh, in 2009 that they proposed uh, a four C's approach, and they were very much uh, engaged in, interestingly, uh, bringing Chinese uh, trade overland and across the sea uh, to, uh, to Syria. Uh, of course, China very much likes this Suhai 4C approach uh, and is very uh, figuring largely uh, in Chinese thinking about how to reassume its position in the world. The problem with the Suhai approach uh, and the Iron Silk Road uh, is that it has to go through this rather tumultuous region, a region that has seen not only shifting boundaries uh, in nation states, uh, but extraordinarily large challenges in terms of nationalism, in terms of Islam, in terms of resources and resource management. Progress has been made on oil pipelines, uh, but clearly getting the energy resources to China is going to be most economic overland through these regions. The problem that in the middle of this region, uh, and as we saw with the Silk Road uh, 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 programming and the, and the Chinese Olympics, the unfolding scroll of Chinese history suggests that China very much wants to reassume its position of influence, if not dominance, in this region. Uh, the problem of China is this crossing of this line, as you well know, in 1993, uh, China became an oil importing nation and became dependent on its involvement and investment in the problematic regions of the Middle East and Central Asia. Prior to this period, China could afford to be less engaged. Uh, it can no longer do so. So suddenly, uh, this region of Xinjiang becomes quite critical. And just as this region becomes more important to China, we see that it is blowing up, uh, not only in the region, but what is most concerning is throughout China, we have had increasing numbers of Uyghur and Xinjiang-related violence, uh, even in the capital of Beijing, the famous Jeep uh, 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 suicide attack uh, in Tiananmen Square, uh, but also in places like Kunming, uh, where we have had knife attacks, and in Guangzhou. Uh, and the increasing number and widespread, uh, we'd had problems in Xinjiang for many years beginning in the late uh, 2000s, about 10 years of peace. Um, and so increasingly, we see that China has a Xinjiang problem. Now, I used to talk about this 20 years ago, and people had known about the Tibet problem, but nobody had heard of Xinjiang and, and the uh, Xinjiang problem. So uh, basically, China is facing these challenges. Uh, several of us got together and put, about, put together a book uh, under the editorship of Fred Starr about this uh, and suggested that China has this uh, dilemma of dealing with the enormous resources in the area, but also transiting the area. And so one way of dealing with and trying to develop Xinjiang into uh, a mineral resource and a well-integrated region uh, is uh, population immigration. Uh, so some people are starting to suggest that China has two strategies. One is to roll through Xinjiang by rail, just like the Trans-Siberian Railroad rolled through Inner Mongolia and did very little for that economy uh, and was not troubled by any of the problems of that region. So the Trans-Eurasian Rail Project may just roll over or roll through. Others suggest that integration through migration, and this to me is the critical chart here, that the, we have a 5% population of Han in the 1940s, which is a pretty well-documented. Uh, you can dispute maybe it's 38, 40% Han now and 48, 42% Uyghur, but nobody can dispute the dramatic rise of Han migration into the region which has put pressure on the Uyghurs as a people who see themselves as the indigenous people of the region. Uh, they feel that they've been made scapegoats as terrorists. Uh, we know that this is, can be a useful policy uh, in, in developing in, um, uh, uh, all kinds of infrastructural arrangements. Uh, some of us were writing that they, the government had argued there was no terrorism in Xinjiang prior to 1911, uh, to 2011, 9-11 uh, uh, in 2001, uh, that there was no terrorism. And the Chinese government itself said that. However, after 9-11, suddenly China had a, a terrorism problem and whole industries of terrorist uh, 
anal analyzation uh, infrastructures began to arise. Um, and so this threat of uh, Al-Qaeda-inspired uh, organized uh, terrorism under this group, ETIM, which several of us have never heard of uh, when it was named as an international terrorist organization. Since then, people have recognized that there were probably many groups. Uh, it's very hard to know which. Uh, several of us have testified that singling out ETIM was a bad idea. It was delisted in 2008. Uh, but nobody denies that China has a problem. And China is worried about Uyghur participation in terrorism, uh, particularly outside of China, and particularly these homegrown terrorists returning to China. Uh, the recent violent incidents have been well chronicled. Uh, there's a very useful website, the Uyghur American Association, a little timeline. You can click on all these incidents. Uh, and what's amazing is that all of the incidents that you do not see in the, in the Western press, or even in the Chinese press, that have begun to come out. Uh, so it's, a, it's an issue that has not been addressed, it's getting worse, uh, and we find that the idea that the carrot is not working, Sean Roberts here at GWU has co-authored a very important article about why the old carrot and stick uh, policy is not working. Uh, I think it's not working uh, because the Chinese policy, it's based on the Soviet legacy that's led to an increase of minorities not a decrease, a rapid increase of minority population has real problems. And lo and behold, another anthropologist, Ma Rong, at Peking University, has begun to call attention to this issue. Uh, I think in interest of time, maybe I should just pause here, and if we have time in the questions to get back to what he's saying, but basically Ma Rong is saying we, the Chinese need to dismantle this Minzu policy, as well as the autonomous region system and make people think of themselves more in terms of cultural and ethnic identity rather than national identity, lest China go the way of the former Soviet Union. Seventy years of this nationalities or Minzu policy has not resolved tensions in Xinjiang or Tibet and other areas as well. I would disagree with Ma Rong on this. I think that the policy in general has a lot of strong points. Uh, and has actually uh, enabled many uh, uh, minority regions to prosper, particularly in Yunnan and the Southwest. Uh, it's Xinjiang and Tibet and perhaps Inner Mongolia, which have legacies of nationalism and nation state identities that are more problematic under this policy. And I have some recommendations that I was going to make, but I'm worried about our time, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, another area where identity uh, and uh, national policy have intersected is uh, in China recently. It's been Hong Kong, which uh, Jacques Delisle uh, will now discuss. He is uh, director of FPRI's Asia program. He is also professor of political science, director of the Center for East Asian Studies, and deputy director for the Center of the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he is uh, recently co-edited a book uh, called China's Challenges, as well as another book, uh, Political Changes in Taiwan under Ma Jingyo. All right, uh, thanks, Stop. Felix. Uh, Drew's always a tough act to, to follow. We've uh, been doing this in some form or another for many years now. Uh, Hong Kong uh, is an odd case on this panel and in the East Asian region and the world more generally. Uh, there's no meaningful dispute that Hong Kong is part of the state of China. Uh, there's no movement for separatism. And there's no real question of self-determination of an ethnically or culturally distinct people, the kind of things that fuel subnational challenges uh, to states typically. Yet Hong Kong has an exceptionally robust structure for autonomous rule as a special administrative region of China. One of the great ironies of Chinese terminology is that special administrative regions have a lot of autonomy, and autonomous regions like Xinjiang have a particularly special kind of administration <laughs> uh, that allows for very little autonomy. Um, Hong Kong has um, the basic law, a mini constitution, that is a detailed embodiment of the one country, two systems model, an arrangement that promises, somewhat contradictorily, a high degree of autonomy and a high degree of continuity with what Hong Kong was under British rule. And this law has its foundations in an international treaty, uh, the joint declaration between the UK and China uh, that arranged for Hong Kong's reversion. <clears throat> the joint declaration both <clears throat> accepted this one country, two systems, high autonomy model, uh, and set forth the basic principles that were then fleshed out in the basic law. 
And this arrangement came against a backdrop of 100 to 150, depending on what part of Hong Kong you're talking about, uh, years of genuinely separate rules. So it really does exist in a, in a way that overlaps only partly with each of the other cases we're talking about. Hong Kong, of course, has been in the news lately uh, because of the controversy over one particular aspect of Hong Kong's peculiar autonomy regime, that is the rules that will govern an election, a rare thing in China, uh, an election of a chief executive for the SAR, and that's the most important position in Hong Kong's uh, executive-dominated <coughs> system uh, for the election that will occur in 2017. And here the key issue, of course, was Beijing's promise that the 2017 election could be conducted through universal suffrage. I know that was a, a, a sort of mass binding act by Beijing where the National People's Congress Standing Committee back in 2004 had rejected calls for more radical, more rapid movement toward universal suffrage both for the chief executive and for the legislators in Hong Kong. Um, and then a few years later did a follow-on decision that said, and the next round of chief executive elections will be conducted under principles of universal suffrage. The underlying uh, premise here was in the basic law itself in Article 45 which says that the chief executive shall be selected by election or through consultation locally, although appointed by the central government, and that the method for selecting the chief executive will be specified in light of the actual situation in Hong Kong. That was what pushed the arguments in the early 2000s for more rapid democratization. And in accordance with the principle of gradual and orderly progress, with the ultimate aim being selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. If we had more time, we could unpack each of those terms, but they all came into play in the debate over what the next election of the CE would look like. And then in August 31st, 2014, uh, I woke up in Hong Kong actually to news uh, that the, uh, that the uh, decision had, was coming down from the NPC, uh, and it said universal suffrage, yes, for 2017, but only as a choice among two to three candidates who would be nominated by a majority of the voters on a special 1,200-member committee. Uh, that committee was essentially the same one that had elected the previous chief executives in a conceitedly not terribly democratic process, and the committee closely resembled the functional constituencies that chose the majority of Hong Kong's legislators. The committee uh, closely resembled all those uh, undemocratic uh, processes which, which um, had been a bete noire of Hong Kong Democrats, and in the vernacular but largely accurate shorthand, the committee was pro-business, pro-local government, and pro-Beijing, pro-administration, pro-Beijing. <clears throat> the NPC decision was, in effect, a rejection of what Hong Kong Democrats, including the leaders of the Occupy Central, or in its full name, Occupy Central with Love and Peace uh, movement had been calling for. This included, in its most radical form, demands for civic nomination, a genuinely open popular nomination process that would allow people to choose from a range of candidates uh, when the election came around. Or failing that, at least rejiggering the nominating committee structure uh, so that it would be less dominated by pro-business and pro-government elements. Or, short of that, at least establishing a very low threshold for the number of supporters you would have to have within the nominating committee uh, to get you on the final ballot. All of these were designed to open the contest to more, more pro-democracy candidates. Uh, well, when this decision came down, people in Hong Kong got fairly exercised. The Occupy Central uh, people, who are you know, roughly my age, they're getting a little, little gray, a little longer in the tooth, uh, they, they uh, were clearly opposed to this. But what happened was the kids got out in front of them. Uh, and so you got a student movement led by the Hong Kong Federation of Students and the interestingly named Scholarism. Uh, and and they, uh, they went off and started occupying Central and occupying Mong Kok and occupying Causeway Bay. Um, and, uh, you know, in a, in a sense, it looked a little bit like the French Revolutionary in the 1960s who said, there go my people, I must find out where they are going so that I can lead them. Uh, so the, the older leaders had to try to get out in front of this and they really couldn't. Um, and, and the student movement, student-led movement, rejected uh, the limited democracy that Beijing was offering, called for a much more immediate move to true universal suffrage, and added to their demands that the chief executive, the not-so-popular Si Wai Leung, with a daughter who made him even less popular with a little YouTube video, um, that, that basically they wanted him out, and they wanted the end of functional constituencies in LegCo, and therefore the move toward democratic elections immediately for the legislature as well. Um, well, Beijing's response was fairly unaccommodating, was really quite stern, quite heavy-handed. Um, and, and even more so in the early phases, uh, we saw a really quite uh, 
in, in some respects, violent response from uh, the local Hong Kong authorities, which included sending the police out to pepper spray the students. The students fended off the pepper, pepper spray with umbrellas, hence the name Umbrella Movement uh, that soon uh, came into vogue. And Beijing's coverage and response was really quite negative, denouncing the chaos, the lawlessness, uh, the uh, openness to foreign influence. Coverage in the international media was pretty sympathetic and it was pretty dense because there were a lot of reporters sitting in Hong Kong who'd been denied visas to be working on the mainland and so they wound up uh, <laughs> covering another event that Beijing didn't exactly want a lot of attention to. And Hong Kong citizens, importantly, were pretty sympathetic. They were sympathetic in part because they were appalled by the violent tactics of the Hong Kong police and they were also sympathetic with the broad goals of democratization. Uh, in those constituencies which are geographic universal suffrage, the pan-democratic candidates do very well. It just doesn't get you a majority in LegCo in the legislature because of the functional constituencies uh, where you get much more narrow uh, groups, mostly pro-business, that, uh, that elect candidates. Um, the public sentiment in Hong Kong, however, eventually turned against the movement as weeks dragged into months, as uh, people started getting resentful about the difficulties of getting around Hong Kong, as the merchants whose businesses were blocked uh, got angry. Uh, and you also saw um, essentially a problem where the protesters, uh, being youthful and uh, idealistic perhaps, <laughs> didn't realize they were running headlong down a blind alley. Uh, there was essentially no way that the local government, the Hong Kong authorities, had the power the authority to accommodate their demands uh, and Beijing wasn't going to um, and so you know it was, it was essentially a view that their demands ultimately were futile or, or, um, or unrealistic. Uh, and then uh, in addition to that we saw a series of, of escalating uh, violent attacks so in the encampments uh, led initially by some shadowy figures who depending on whom you believe were either Hong Kong's notorious triads, the criminal gangs, or hired thugs by businessmen who wanted their businesses back, particularly in Hong Kong, or perhaps agents of Beijing. But in the end, uh, as sentiment turned against the students, ultimately the, the police uh, removed the encampments by year's end and the movement was at least for the time being over. Then comes April and we get the consultation report uh, from the government in effect uh, setting forth the terms of the final decision that Beijing would okay for elections, uh, for election rules uh, for 2017. And this offered only very modest changes from the initial proposal in August, really nothing significant. And so now we're waiting for the legislature to ask, act. There will have to be amendments to the basic law annex to change the rules for electing the chief executive and this under the terms of the earlier National People's Congress Standing Committee interpretation of the basic law back in 2007, this requires two-thirds support in the legislature to pass. The pan-democratic uh, representatives have one-third plus four. Uh, and so if they can hold their group together and not lose uh, four or more, uh, then the legislation won't pass and we will default to the old rule of the group of 1,200 selecting the next chief executive. So we have this summer a battle ahead where there will be pressure from the pro-government or pro-Beijing side to not deny Hong Kong universal suffrage, to accept the thin edge of this wedge, the, the prospect of, of greater future democratization down the road, uh, and the argument that if Hong Kong doesn't take this, uh, Beijing will not give it anything more, a kind of pragmatic half a loaf argument. On the other side, we will see a lot of pressure, including from people who participated in or supported uh, the Occupy movement, who will say, no, we need to be uncompromisingly uh, pro-democracy here. Uh, if you don't take a principled stand, you're giving away the game. And once you accept what's on the table, what's on offer from Beijing, there will be no uh, great pressure to move forward rapidly toward greater democratization. All right, that's sort of the TikTok. Um, but I want to turn to the, uh, the broader concerns here about whether Hong Kong uh, in the controversy over the chief executive and in the broader uh, trajectory of, of debates over Hong Kong political development of which it is the most recent installment, whether that constitutes a challenge to the state. <coughs> and I think there are a few aspects to the story. First, uh, you know, does Hong Kong really constitute a subnational challenge? I mean, Xi Jinping reportedly characterized the umbrella movement as a challenge to Beijing, not just to the Hong Kong SAR government. It was really quite, uh, uh, quite histrionic language in some ways. Uh, and in a sense, this is a challenge. What came up in Hong Kong in the, in the debates and the, in the umbrella movement and so on was a challenge to uh, Beijing's favored approach to how one particular part of China, a part that has already been given special privileges not available in the rest of China, a challenge uh, to the quasi-federalism on steroids in effect that Beijing accepted for a different regime for Hong Kong than for the rest of China, uh, and, that's, and that Beijing did so despite a general aversion to federalism, uh, that all of this was being challenged, that Hong, people in Hong Kong were asking for a lot more, to be more autonomous, more different, and to be there sooner rather than later. 
As I said earlier, there's no whiff of separatism in all this, but there is a question about whether Hong Kong politics in the wake of the Umbrella Movement have changed in a way that will make these sorts of challenges a recurring and enduring feature of politics in Hong Kong. Uh, the portrait that Hong Kong is an economic, not a political city has always been a bit overdrawn, but it has been significantly believed, I think, in Beijing. And the question is whether the Occupy movement marks a turn, uh, particularly the politicization of a younger generation of Hong Kong residents, uh, such that Beijing can no longer count on waiting out people my age or older uh, who got their democratic chops during the transition, the Tiananmen reaction, and, and the run-up to reversion. It's too early to say that that's true, but if it is, it makes Hong Kong a permanent thorn in the side of Beijing and a challenge to a certain way of conducting governance. Uh, secondly, there's a question of Beijing's strong and harsh reaction to the Umbrella Movement, a response that certainly portrayed and perhaps even genuinely regarded the Umbrella Movement as a significant threat. And there's several possibilities to explain this harsh reaction, each of which, if you play them out, have somewhat different implications uh, for what lies ahead. First is the possibility that Beijing was ill-advised and misinformed that it listened to, uh, to the chief executive and to the tycoons in Beijing, I'm sorry, tycoons in Hong Kong, who had their own parochial reasons for opposing the Democrats' agenda of political power redistribution and possible economic wealth redistribution, and who generally held the Democrats in contempt, and who have longstanding uh, proponents uh, of the view that Hong Kong is purely an economic city. It's also possible Beijing understood what was going on but simply didn't care. Uh, that the current regime was intransigent because it could, be, it could be that way, because it bore no real consequences, international pressure would have relatively limited impact, and so on. Uh, thirdly, it's possible that Beijing feared a democratic contagion from Hong Kong, uh, that there would be a challenge to the Chinese state as currently constituted, that people in Hong Kong uh, would get not only what Beijing has promised, but demand more and get more and do so by taking to the streets. That's a troubling example. Uh, why wouldn't people elsewhere in China, be it in Xinjiang or in Beijing, say, why not us too? Um, now, it was well short of that, despite all the discussion of chaos and disorder and, and how, how, uh, how dangerous the movement was. Uh, but one hallmark of China in the reform era, and certainly in the Xi Jinping era, has been uh, a, a consistent commitment to maintaining a monopoly of organized politics. So you can grouse, you can complain, you can uh, voice heterodox views, but when it looks like an organized movement that seems to take uh, some political leverage, uh, you get cracked down on, whether you be Falun Gong or rights protection lawyers or uh, Xinjiang uh, uh, groups that engage in, in sometimes violent actions or you're part of civil society uh, more generally in a way that takes on the regime in a public and organized way. Or finally, the harsh response from Beijing may reflect, as some critics from Beijing and pro-Beijing sources in Hong Kong asserted, persisting concerns about challenges to Chinese sovereignty. That is the idea that this was a foreign influence movement, that there were black hands in the U.S. and elsewhere that were manipulating the Democrats or egging them on. Uh, this, of course, has deep resonance. Uh, after all, the Hong Kong problem for China started with foreign interference and encroachment on Chinese sovereignty. Again, it's somewhat outlandish to say that that was really what was going on, but it was a striking part of Beijing's rhetoric. Uh, finally, um, Beijing's response was not without cost to the Chinese state and its agenda. It risks alienating important groups in Hong Kong in the long run. Uh, it risks uh, reinforcing the worst suspicions in Taiwan about what a one country, two systems model might look like were Taiwan to pursue some degree or accept some degree of, of uh, grappling with the sovereignty question and even nominal uh, reintegration. And it resonated rather badly with an increasingly sour view of China among its neighbors and in the United States, a sort of heavy-handed, uh, uh, ham-fisted, if you will, response. Uh, and I'm running out of time here, so let me just touch on one final uh, question, which is to, to take a step back and I'll talk about the potential broader importance of the chief executive um, uh, election issue, the flap over that, uh, in, in uh, terms of, of it being a subnationally based challenge to the Chinese state and its aims and agendas. Its, its significance isn't just that it resonates across issues in space, as I just suggested. It's also that it is the latest installment in a now decades-old struggle over the nature of governance uh, in Hong Kong as a part of China. In this context, the basic law, and even more clearly the interpretation and implementation of the basic law, which resides partly in Beijing and partly in Hong Kong, is a matter of the Chinese sovereign's unilateral and largely discretionary exercise of its own sovereign power over Chinese people and Chinese territory. This has been the theme running in all the major disputes over constitutional, legal, and political development in Hong Kong 
since the 1980s. Uh, it, you can see it in the conflict not only over the chief executive elections recently, but you can go back to the prior push for democratizing elections to the legislature and the chief executive for 2007-2008, which was rejected in 2004. Back to the thwarted effort of the first uh, chief executive of the SAR, Dong Jianhua, to introduce anti-sedition and security legislation under Article 23 of the Basic Law, back to the 1999 controversy over whether the Court of Final Appeal had the authority to interpret the Basic Law in a way that Beijing did not like, uh, back all the way to um, the last British governor, Chris Patton, uh, and his attempt to democratize Hong Kong by expanding the functional constituencies toward near universal suffrage and create a legislature which was supposed to ride the through train from pre-reversion to post-reversion Hong Kong, but was derailed by Beijing's opposition. In these and other controversies, Beijing and its allies in Hong Kong stressed the letter of the law, the text of the basic law, the text of the interpretations, and in many of the cases, Beijing at least had a colorable and sometimes a pretty good argument. Indeed, as I noted earlier, it's somewhat ironic and certainly telling that a significant factor impelling uh, the, the NPC to its 2014 decision on chief executive elections was its own statement that it would adopt uh, universal suffrage for 2017. But, and with this I'll close, the strength or weakness of Beijing's and its allies' positivist arguments about law are only part of the point. The point here and the more fundamental one uh, is about the nature of, of what goes on in Hong Kong and, and how it might be a threat to, to the Chinese state's view of things, uh, is that Beijing's pro-democracy antagonists in Hong Kong rely significantly, although not exclusively, on a fundamentally different kind of argument which doesn't care that much about the law in the books, about the text of the Constitution. Instead, it's about what it means to govern and govern well. It is an invocation of rights, including human rights, including the human right to democracy as embodied in the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, and the idea is that this is just what the state owes its people, and so on. If that's what's going on here, and I think it is, then the conflicts of views and in turn values uh, has long been explicitly joined in Hong Kong, and that conflict in Hong Kong may be a harbinger or at least provide a window into still incipient but potentially profound developments that matter at the supranational rather than subnational levels. In recent years, and especially since Xi Jinping and the fifth generation leadership came to power, and arguably even more in the most recent months, there's been a pointed rejection of Western style constitutionalism, liberal democratic values, and so on. An argument even perhaps for the superiority of an as yet inchoate distinctively Chinese model, uh, as being appropriate at least for China and possibly for other states as well. This is still tentative, it's still inchoate, uh, but I and, it is, and it's limited by uh, China's weak soft power, but if it does mature and, it do and if it does ripen into a conflict of values with the U.S. and the West that moves beyond struggles for power and interest and instead into ideational conflict, then Hong Kong will have been the first laboratory experiment in this new and rather unhappy scenario. Thanks. Thank you, Jacques. Um, rounding out our discussion on this panel will be uh, Christine Kim. Uh, Christine is a uh, visiting assistant professor at, in the Asia, Asian Studies program at Georgetown University. She teaches modern Korean history, and her research and writing is focused on national identity, material culture, and political movements. Her forthcoming book is uh, The King is Dead. <laughs> explores the way uh, colonization and modernization have influenced Korean polity and identity. Christy. Thank you very much, and I'd like to echo the panelists in thanking the organizers of this conference and for inviting me to participate. Um, I'll be speaking about the ancient Korean kingdom of Goguryeo, um, providing first a brief summary of how this became a political issue in 2004. Uh, and then discussing ways in which this problem um, has had an impact on Korea's relations with, with China, obviously, with the United States, and with North Korea. Uh, less, a little more than a decade ago, a debate over the history of the relationship between Korea and China broke out as part of an escalating dispute between Seoul and Beijing over the origins and legacy of the Goguryeo Kingdom. Uh, this is a, an early state that existed from 37 BC to 668 AD. Uh, it's one of the three kingdoms uh, when the peninsula was divided uh, into sort of a warring state period. And perhaps most relevant to our understanding is that it's the one state that was most at odds with Chinese interests. Uh, it eventually 
uh, fell due to the uh, cooperation between the other two states, um, the other two kingdoms with the um, with the Tang Dynasty. So it has a reputation as being uh, confrontational, of not having submitted to Chinese authority. Uh, and at its peak, its territorial borders expanded beyond the Korean Peninsula into parts of northeast China, and parts of uh, present-day Manchuria. So PRC claims that Goguryeo is part of China's history by claiming that it was a vassal state that had been founded by ethnic Koreans who were part of a larger Chinese empire, provoked an immense public response of outrage in Korea. This was the first major political dispute to arise between Seoul and Beijing since the two states normalized relations in 1992, and it led to a number of high-level exchanges designed to calm the situation while continuing to coordinate efforts to keep alive the ongoing six-party talks at the time. Seoul's South Korean reaction to the Kogryo history dispute reflected increasing worries in Seoul on the political and economic fronts. There was perceptions of an expansionist China, as well as anxieties regarding South Korea's increasing economic dependence on Chinese trade and investments. But also at stake was the question of Korean national identity in both South and North Korea, and the ways in which Goguryeo figures into the narrative of Korean history. Although tensions that might have spilled over into the political, economic, and security fronts have since receded, Goguryeo may still represent Northeast Asia's next intractable history war. The competing accounts of Sino-Korean views on Goguryeo's history were initiated in 2001, not by South Korea but, or China, but in fact by North Korea. It had submitted an application <coughs> to UNESCO to register what became uh, the country's first uh, World Heritage Site um, based on the kingdom's royal tomb uh, remains. That process was still pending when the following year the Chinese government launched its own high-profile Northeast Asia History Project and submitted a competing application to UNESCO to have some royal uh, tomb sites that are situated on present-day uh, Chinese soil as um, its own uh, World Heritage Sites. And then jumping into the fray was the Republic of Korea, which established a Goguryeo Research Foundation, now known as the Northeast Asia Foundation. And it set the stage for a potential confrontation over historical and territorial issues. The Chinese government then countered by issuing stamps bearing the image mm -hmm. of Goguryeo murals. Um, and it has also continued to fund research efforts into these Northeast Asian provinces to continue research archaeological excavations. So while North Korean response to Chinese uh, actions have been muted, that perhaps a reflection of the very close ties between the country or the, the realities of Chinese dependent, uh, North Korean dependence on, on the PRC, in South Korea, the public backlash at the time was tremendous. Uh, an ill-conceived move by the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs to edit its website's references to Koguryeo and Korean history and why it has histories of other countries on uh, the ministry's website is uh, perhaps some, a question others can <laughs> answer. Um, but it led to a flurry of outraged responses in South Korea, ranging from cyber activists' denouncements to calls for economic sanctions and uh, economic boycotts sort of a remnant from the colonial period. In the realm of public opinion, the controversy engendered a harsh reassessment in South Korea of Chinese rise and its expanding influence and uh, its implications for the peninsula. Now here it's important to note that South Korean interest in and identification with Goguryeo is a fairly recent phenomenon. Until the 1980s, the favorite state among the three kingdoms was, in fact, Shilla, which is based in the northeast of the peninsula. Uh, and it's partly because of this 
situation, where it, where it was situation, situated and where, from which region um, many of South Korean leaders had emerged. Um, but also, uh, it was Shilla that had successfully completed the unification of the peninsula. So uh, for, for much of um, the Korean, uh, South Korean uh, Republican period, um, it's, it's Shilla that has been sort of the uh, alpha uh, kingdom <laughs> among them. Uh, and the northern region of the peninsula has historically been shunned as a cultural backwater through much of the Joseon dynasty. Uh, and it's not until the late 19th century that progressives sought to break out of the longstanding Sinocentric tribute relationship that uh, promoted Koguryo military figures as nationalist heroes. Uh, similar impulses were at work during the period of Park Jung-hee, a military man who sought to revive Korean pride in its own culture by uh, resuscitating some of these ancient uh, heroes um, as, as national um, leadership figures. Um, and he gave fulsome praise to the exemplars of the Korean martial spirit, uh, including Admiral Lee Sun Shin against, uh, you know, a sort of um, the uh, uber anti-Japanese military figure. Um, he recognized the military corps of the Hwarang of the Shilla dynasty and the kingdom of Koguryo. Uh, so in this way, Koguryo serves as a symbol of Korean national pride, representing muscular foreign policy, military expansionism, expansionism that extended into China, and a distinct artistic achievement as exemplified by the uh, murals and the old tomb sites. Um, and so, in short, it's the epitome of Korean self-determination. So the PRC's revisionist views on Koguryo in 2004 sparked Korean public anxieties about China's rise as a strategic threat, um, and it stimulated a reassessment on the conventional wisdom that had previously viewed China almost solely through the lens of economic opportunities. A popular assessment was that China's hegemonic ambition has now been exposed, um, and here they, uh, the South Korean press made frequent references to the tributary system, the old East Asian order that was um, uh, mentioned uh, earlier this morning. National assemblymen from both parties joined hands to support a resolution criticizing the PRC and mobilized committee, committees to monitor the issue. Um, but ultimately, both China and Korea uh, compromised. They came to an understanding in time to celebrate the 12th year commemoration of the normalized ties, uh, with the Chinese pledging to remove its claims to Koguryo from Chinese history books, although not from its foreign ministry website. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the effects on um, Korean-U.S. relations were that they had long been experiencing um, uh, tense relations, um, and in part because of this uh, episode in Sino-Korean ties, uh, the negative repercussions resulting from that fallout uh, showed that, in fact, it reversed the anti-American sentiment that had emerged during the No Hyun administration. So that whereas in 2003, 63% uh, of South Korean legislators had identified China as the country's most significant partner, in the year after, when this episode uh, exploded, um, the China approval ratings dropped to a fraction of that, to 6%, uh, a very precipitous drop. Um, and the schism created also um, uh, promoted opportunities for South Korea to perhaps um, uh, take actions that it might not have in previous situations, so that, for example, it signed an aviation agreement with Taiwan in 2004, allowing direct service between Taipei and Seoul. Despite these bumps, the two are back on track as partners in growth, um, 
Recent visits by Park Geun-hye, uh, the South Korean president, to Beijing have been very warmly regarded uh, in both countries, and, and her ability to speak Chinese, some Chinese has also been um, praised rather than criticized um, as an act of um, sort of proactive diplomacy rather than uh, ancient toadyism. Uh, South Korean trade with China has continued to grow, last year amounting to $215 billion. Uh, with Chinese investments flows to Korea, to Korea surging from the previous year uh, at the rate of 374 percent. So clearly this is a continuing growth trajectory. Um, these figures suggest that ancient history matters less than economic ties and ultimately Kogryo stands no chance against growing economic in interdependence. Um, all the same, the South Korean Ministry of Trade has implemented measures to monitor foreign or Chinese mergers and technology transfers, reflecting perhaps South Korean fears of China's emergence as a competitor in third country markets and concerns about the rapid erosion of South Korea's comparative advantage over China in the high tech sector. Uh, in, on the metric of popular uh, con uh, consumerism, soft power, or the Korean wave, the Koguryo controversy seems to have been conveniently forgotten. South Korea continues to attract large numbers of Chinese tourists, 58% uh, growth in 2014 to 6.1 million visitors, far more than any other country. Uh, this has been fueled by K-pop, uh, shopping opportunities, and cosmetic tourism. Likewise, for China, the largest number of foreign tourists come from Korea. China's university language programs have been inundated with Korean students. Uh, Korean shopkeepers are uh, hurriedly learning uh, Chinese. And um, the uh, Korean airlines in ASEANA continue to compete for expanding flights to all parts of China. One unintended or unexpected consequence of China's revisionist views on Koguryo has been the increased cooperation between North and South Korea in the realm of cultural preservation. Even amidst heightened tensions on the peninsula, both uh, states have continued to commit resources to promoting research on the national patrimony, uh, including Koguryo antiquities. Uh, just this year, um, the South Korean Ministry of Culture identified uh, excavations uh, at Koguryo tomb sites, joint excavations, as one of its top priorities for the year. So Pyongyang's interest in archaeological research is perhaps a subtle way of expressing its displeasure with Beijing. Um, it, it feeds all, it's, it's based on a long-standing connection between antiquities and propaganda in North Korea. Uh, that go all the way back to the 1950s when Kim Il-sung uh, gave um, uh, priority to the importance of um, antiquities and preservation as a way of establishing the regime's legitimacy. Um, so those are some of the ways in which this uh, episode has continued to resonate. It's important to keep in mind that Chinese and Korean positions have not reached a compromise. Uh, they, in fact, remain rigidly set. Koreans North and South overwhelmingly view Koguryo as ancestral, ancestral land and regard the Chinese claim of a vassal state or one founded by an ethnic group, you know, part of the Minzu uh, policy that uh, was uh, mentioned earlier, as a sign of hegemonic behavior and arrogance. Uh, in a report released in, uh, by CSIS recently, one participant, one Korean participant, expressed the view that, quote, by suggesting the Korean peninsula is ancient Chinese land, China has shown that it intends to annex North Korea. While Koguryo is arguably less important to Chinese national identity than it is to Korea's, it serves as a useful uh, example of uh, history that affirms Chinese greatness and pride, a story featuring an ethnic minority of two million with a happier ending than the Uyghur problem in the West. Um, and with the intensification of bilateral ties at every le level, uh, conflicts are also inevitable. As this new conflict emerges, one test of the relationship will be whether Korea's institutional structures are sufficient to manage the relationship and minimize political conflict, uh, 
while contending with a robust and testy democratic society at home, one in which uh, nationalist spirit has often spilled into issues such as um, U.S. beef imports or the comfort women to the point where it, sometimes they could become very close to unmanageable. Uh, and so on that note, um, I might put forward that uh, this uh, it is yet to be seen whether this might emerge as a thorn in the side of evolving Sino-Korean relations. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, uh, for a wonderful discussion. Um, we'll open the floor up to, the, to questions. In the interest of time, I think we'll take uh, three questions, and then uh, we'll give our panelists an opportunity to answer. So go ahead. This is a question for Mike Mochizuki. You mentioned that the U.S. bases were originally concentrated uh, in Okinawa after World War II, not for strategic, but for financial reasons. My question is, how much is this still true today? Could U.S. military uh, units, especially in the Marines, be relocated uh, to the United States um, strategically uh, uh, just as effectively as they are in Okinawa now? Uh, my question direct at uh, Gr Professor Gladney. Uh, during your presentation, you mentioned that uh, because of uh, time limit, you could not uh, say some recommendations. So, so could you elaborate uh, what kind of recommendations are in terms of the Xinjiang? Thank you. Okay. And we'll take one more uh, right in the middle there. All right. I was hoping you could elaborate on, <coughs> sorry, the impact ISIS is having, the rise of ISIS in Xinjiang. Yes, thank you. Mike, you want to? Thanks very much for that uh, question, uh, uh, Steve. Um, in, in terms of uh, the strategic rationale, especially uh, uh, for the Marine Corps, I mean, first of all, you know, my view is that uh, having some U.S. military presence in Okinawa makes uh, eminent sense, and, and I think the top priority is the, uh, the Kadena Air Force Base, uh, which is the largest U.S. Uh, uh, air base uh, out in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. Uh, but in terms of the uh, Marine Corps uh, deployment, uh, I think it's uh, uh, quite possible to reduce uh, by quite a bit the Marine uh, presence and still uh, continue to be able to deter as well as to respond uh, during a crisis. Uh, when you think about a Korean Peninsula crisis, uh, it seems to me that the possibility of using Okinawa as a staging area for some kind of counteroffensive on the Korean Peninsula uh, seems to be uh, misguided. If one looks at uh, the 1950 uh, uh, Korean War, uh, that the, the major, major staging area uh, was on Kyushu uh, rather uh, than on Okinawa. I mean, Okinawa is, is further away. Uh, the other is in terms of a possible Taiwan crisis, and I think it would be uh, horrible if uh, the United States and China uh, and Japan uh, were to be involved in a high-intensity conflict over uh, Taiwan. But if something like that were to uh, occur, uh, given that the Taiwan issue is such a core interest of, of China, I think uh, having too many of our military assets uh, in Okinawa make them highly vulnerable to uh, missile attacks uh, by China. And it's hard for me to imagine uh, how uh, having a garrison force of Marines on Okinawa helps uh, with a Taiwan uh, scenario. And so then the, the final scenario in which uh, one can uh, imagine uh, a role for uh, the Marines uh, is the Senkaku uh, Daoyu uh, dispute. Uh, but here, you know, I think the United States uh, 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 you know, does not uh, have uh, a position on the sovereignty issue, which is in line with the, the Japanese uh, view on this. So if you're going to have deterrence, the best way is for the Japanese to engage in self-help uh, from uh, beefing up its Coast Guard uh, capabilities as well as its own uh, defense uh, capabilities. To the extent uh, that having the Marines uh, nearby so that China would not risk uh, 
involving the United States in a military conflict. Here again, uh, one can imagine a much more compact uh, U.S. Uh, military uh, uh, presence uh, and still uh, provide deterrence. Already, the U.S. Marine Corps has been moving uh, towards, uh, away from the garrison uh, notion of having uh, the 3rd MEF concentrated in Okinawa and has moved towards uh, developing another hub uh, in Guam, uh, moving uh, forces uh, to Hawaii, rotating forces uh, to Australia. And so, you know, I think it's quite possible uh, that in the next 10 to 20 years, we will see a very different configuration of the marine uh, deployments in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. And therefore, my conclusion is that it makes very little sense uh, to uh, cause such anger in Okinawa uh, by going ahead stubbornly uh, to build uh, a landfill military base on Henoko, uh, which will be destructive uh, of the environment uh, there. Yeah, on the conclusions, I uh, did put a slide up that uh, um, I wanted to show this pictures of the entrance to Afghanistan from Xinjiang, the Wakhan Corridor, where I was standing uh, 11 days when I, before 9-11 when I took that picture. So I think it's appropriate to show uh, some of the conclusions that relate to China's policy in Xinjiang, which to some degree is concerned about problems in neighboring Pakistan and Afghanistan, particularly the rise of radical Islam, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, of course, bin Laden was there. Uh, China was very worried about that, and that, I think, does suggest why it's been so repressive in the region and fear afraid of the spillover of radical Islam. I just should point out that um, with some of these issues of globalization and transnational communications, nearly one million Uyghur diaspora are connected increasingly with the Uyghurs in China. And so there's been a, a gradual increase in awareness of these issues. Uh, on the, the appeal of ISIS to these Uyghurs, um, I should mention that bin Laden never mentioned the Uyghur problem, though he was quite sympathetic to a lot of Muslim liberation movements from the Philippines to Palestine. Uh, Al-Zarqawi did, uh, but there's no evidence that there was any real uh, concern, mainly because the realization, as we found out with the detainees in Guantanamo, that the Uyghurs are concerned about the liberation of their homeland. It's an ethno-religious nationalist movement, uh, which is certainly not on the agenda of Al-Qaeda, neither ISIS. So the idea of nationalism and independence and sovereignty, which is motivating much of the Uyghur resistance to Chinese rule, uh, Islam is certainly mixed into that, uh, is antithetical uh, to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and radical jihadist Islam. I'll point out as well that what uh, motivates many Uyghurs is a passion for their culture, their history. Uh, Uyghur Islam is permeated by Sufism, uh, a celebration of Maqam, the leg the uh, epic songs and dancing we all know about. Uh, so that is not certainly uh, uh, appealing to radical jihadis. Uh, having said that, um, uh, we should note that there is increasing uh, conservative Islam in the region. And my theory is that the Uyghur young, disenfranchised, underemployed Uyghur men are being pushed in that direction. And they're one of the very few organized groups uh, that can provide support and succor, though traditionally Uyghurs have been quite resistant to that. Now on the Chinese role, I think that it's crucial that China cannot really solve Xinjiang problems by running a rail line through the region and ignoring the problems, or uh, bringing in resources from outside, nor by flooding the region with Han immigrants. I've been trying to do that for 60 years. Uh, and expanding rails, expanding roads has, has in some ways only exacerbated the inequitous situation between the indigenous people uh, who have been told it is their autonomous region. Uh, they were recognized by the Chinese state as a nationality, a rather recent one actually. Um, and so therefore, the, there needs to be some serious rethinking of that policy. There has been, but there, as far as we can tell under Xi Jinping, it's only become more severely repressive and resistant to any voice or endangering loyalty. 
Uh, and finally, U.S. responses. I'm sorry you might not be able to see those from the back because it goes so low on the screen. But I really think that we have a common cause with China on national threats, uh, the blurring of the boundaries. Uh, organized groups like ISIS blur the boundaries between religion, nation, and state. Uh, we are committed to the nation state system, the United Nations. It's in both of our interests to address these non state, anti state actors. Uh, and radical Islam is anti state. Uh, there should be one state, and that's the global Ummah. Any other state or dem democratic process or nationalist practice is, is anathema and antithetical to that regime, to that ideology. And then finally, uh, supporting diversity and equitable development in China in whatever we, way we can, through NGOs, et cetera, and cooperate with China in developing a new East Asian security order. I strongly support Ambassador Roy's call for greater cooperation on mutual uh, uh, concerns in this region. I think we have time to squeeze in one more question, if we have one more question. Gil? Yes, I have one for uh, Professor Kim. Uh, the Gugurio issue, you said, was so big for a year or so, and then it has faded away, rather, and right, in fact, right away, Japan became a bigger issue in 2005. And then there was the, in, under President Im myung bak there was a kind of culture war between China and South Korea on some issues, distrust and so on. So what accounts for the lack of attention to the Chinese national identity and cultural challenge as seen in recent polling that suggests the Japanese military threat is taken more seriously than the Chinese military threat in Korea. What about Korean national identity allows for China to be handled so gingerly <laughs> despite your Gogurio theme? Perhaps the fundamental difference is just the, the size of the uh, Chinese economy and the interest that it generates. Um, the, uh, the Chinese and South Korean relationship was for over a decade referred to as a, a very blissful honeymoon uh, that, that came to an abrupt end in 2004 but then has now since resumed. Um, and as you've correctly identified, um, the reconciliation was in part mediated by a, the unintended participation of, of uh, Japanese nationalism um, and its reluctance uh, in, to make policy rec uh, uh, concessions um, on uh, World War II reconciliation front. Um, the I don't think that the uh, Koguryo issue has completely gone away. Um, it is perhaps lying um, uh, in wait for yet another possible uh, rupture, but I think that the uh, competing uh, or d distracting issues on the South Korean um, template have sort of pushed it to the sidelines for the time being. Um, other than that, I don't really have a, a cogent answer in terms of why the Chinese uh, have been treated so differently from, from Korea. Um, but uh, one thing that uh, was perhaps significantly different is that when there seemed to be um, a joint interest in promoting, for example, the 12th year commemoration of the normalization between the two countries, there was in fact some degree of shuttle diplomacy that allowed for a compromise to be reached between the two states. And that seems to have had uh, some impact on sort of mollifying South Korean sensibilities. Um, and more recently, there, the sort of shared interest uh, in, in terms of labeling Japan as, as the bad guy in the region um, have given rise to things such as the Anjungun Memorial Hall in Harbin um, that seem to, again, distract from the still lingering tensions between the two. 
All right, well, thank you, uh, panelists, for a great discussion. And uh, this concludes the first panel uh, for today's conference. Do we have lunch and sessions yet? Lunch will be served in the ante room across the hall, and then you can walk right into the cafeteria with your food. This was Vincent Young, and she was. Uh,